It is so important that we think from day one, why are we building this? What are the upsides? What are the potential downsides or the real existing downsides? And how can we craft something, either either don't do it or do it in a way that makes the upsides you know, really worth the risk of the downsides, right? And tries to mitigate the potential for the downsides. These are very important issues today. Hi, I'm Gabe Lyons, and welcome to our Science and Faith series. Throughout this series, I'm going to be interviewing several different people who work within the scientific field, the academic and scholarship fields, who are working on this intersection of science and helping us understand how human beings and science move together and help us, the more we understand them, better understand who we were made to be, how we were made to function. Now, today's conversation with Dr. Rosalind Picard. And Rosalind Picard is someone who's been a part of our events before. She has shared her stories. She's now, over the last many years, become somebody who even on TED Talks has millions of views on her future views of how effective computing interacts with the emotions of human beings. And she's an amazing scientist, a researcher, an inventor, an engineer. She's a member of the faculty of MIT's Media Lab, and she's the founder and director of the Effective Computing Research Group at the MIT Media Lab and the founding faculty chair of MIT's Mind and Heart Initiative. She is an elected member of the National Academy of Engineering, one of the highest professional honors accorded an engineer, and it recognizes her contributions to effective computing and wearable computing. And while there's no Nobel Prize in computer science, as computer science did not exist when Alfred Nobel set up his prizes, she received what's called the Lombardi Nobel Prize by many people internationally because she has contributed so significantly to this field. Now, in our conversation today, we're going to explore artificial intelligence, its impact on human connection, and also explore helping you better understand this field of wearable technology and how science can help us better understand human interaction and even lead to life-saving devices and ways in which we can help human beings function and flourish better. I think you're going to enjoy this conversation, but even more than that, the thoughtfulness by which she pursues her calling. Let's listen in now. Dr. Rosalind Picard, it's so great to have you with us for this discussion. And you've done such important work in this field around effective computing, as well as just this understanding of artificial intelligence and emotions. And I want to get into that today, what you're learning, what you're seeing, and how all of us could benefit from some of the ways in which you've seen effective computing impact human dignity, human life, healing, and so with that, I wonder if you would just start by defining for us, what is effective computing? Uh, thanks, Gabe. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Effective computing, spelled with an A, but hopefully nicely confused with effective computing, uh, was defined originally by me as computing that relates to, arises from, or deliberately influences emotion. And I'll, I have to add a qualifier. Today, what people think of as computing is a little different than what we did at the time. Today, it's everything that's in our uh, voice assistants, smartphones, uh, smartwatch. Uh, back then, people it, you know, tended to think of it as any kind of processing. Um, but today, sometimes people think computing is only what's in a laptop or desktop. And that's not true. It's meant to be in all forms of computation. Yeah. And what was your motivation to go into this field? You've, you've clearly had an incredible run of discovery, invention. It's been recognized around the world the way that you've pioneered. But personally for you, what drew you into this field of study? I did not really want to go into this field of study, I'll say. I was trying to build computers that were better at perceiving information around them so that we could interact with them better, so they could have more perceptual intelligence, you know, and see, for example, if the person in front of the computer was getting annoyed uh, which is the number one emotion people were experiencing and often still experience with technology. And it wasn't going to figure out how to behave in a very intelligent way if it couldn't even see that it had irritated its most important customer. So my initial focus was just on having computers be less frustrating, less annoying, uh, more intelligent to interact with people. And in learning more about how uh, intelligence in the brain worked, we, we you know, I 
was and continue to be blown away and inspired by the human brain, the human mind. And uh, in studying that, I learned about the important role of emotion, which was the last thing a woman in science and engineering wanted to be associated with. So I tried to get a lot of other guys to work on it. Uh, that did not work. So I started uh, gathering the science into a paper, which got rejected. Uh, so then I wrote a book on it, and that had better legs. Yeah, so this area of emotion that you brought up, I mean, it, it does seem like one of those areas that's been counterintuitive when we talk about technology at least a couple of decades ago. But now more and more people are recognizing how essential it is to recognize emotion, to respond with emotional depth and a responsiveness that shows empathy. And th those are some of those areas that you were developing. Why is that so important for computers for digital technology or for artificial intelligence to be able to react and respond to human beings in a way that feels like they're understanding them. Thank you. You're you're wording it very smartly, and I really appreciate that. Uh, sometimes people misword it as the computers have emotions, and they don't have emotions or feelings, as you've very carefully avoided saying. Thank you. Uh, they are. It is important if you're having a dialogue with somebody and they're expressing a strong emotion. To ignore that emotion is like ignoring something important about that human being. It's, it's not respecting them. It's not treating them with dignity. And if a, uh, whether it's in a text dialogue or a face-to-face -face chat, if there is emotion being clearly communicated, it's really important to acknowledge that, uh, to um, sometimes verbalize it. Sometimes you want to ignore it <laughs> for a little while, but you shouldn't ever just completely ignore it, right? You should right. think about what's being communicated and show respect for the person's feelings. Yeah, so as this relationship continues to grow and we're seeing more and more people come to rely on technology, come to rely on computers to speak to them, to give them information, to help them learn, to in some ways even be a relationship, right? There, there's a relationship that's oh. developing here. I can see all kinds of great benefits to that relationship. But then I can also start to imagine when a human being starts to rely on a computer like it's a real human relationship and it's taking the place of true human connection and interaction that that can create a codependency that doesn't necessarily lead the human to flourish in the way they've been designed. How do you navigate the ethical tensions of that, trying to work around that in your field that's become so important to, to helping so many people that are suffering with chronic disease and challenges that this is really helping them. But how do you navigate that ethical bridge? Yeah, thank you. I added a, a it used to be that I had a lecture on ethics in my affective computing class. Now I integrate it into every lecture. Uh, it is so important that we think from day one, uh, what are, why are we building this? What are the upsides? What are the potential downsides or the real, you know, existing downsides? And how can we craft something, either, either don't do it or do it in a way that makes the upsides, you know, really worth the risk of the downsides, right? And tries to mitigate the potential for the downsides. Um, these are very important issues today. Uh, and they were from the beginning. I, um, you know, we know that we all, we're like made for relationship, right? It's right. in us. And even before, you know, computing was widespread, we would see, you know, I don't know about you, but I remember when my first car I had bought and, you know, polished and taken care of. And when I sold it, to, I bought it used and then I sold it used. And the day the guy drove it off, I felt sad. Like my relationship with this mechanical thing was being driven out of my life, right? There was a, this odd kind of relationship and the car couldn't even reciprocate, right? But yet people have relationships with things and um, it is unhealthy when those get in the way of relationships with other people. So one of the values we bring into our work is we are not trying to build relationships or technology that replaces people. We're trying to build uh, technology that helps people be better people, that helps improve human lives, that gives us um, if you will, you know, new abilities, sometimes we call them superpowers, right? If it's something you're struggling with and the computer's helping you overcome that. So this is a value uh, decision that we make when we design things. It's not one made by everybody in the field. Some people in the field are just trying to build the AI that's going to become so amazing that we'll be lucky if it keeps us around as a household pet. 
Yeah. Uh, and yeah, that's, <laughs> well, and, you know, I don't want my great grandchildren to say, gee, my mom's work is what led to us being household pets. Well, and I think I appreciate you bringing that up because that's certainly, if we're going to think well about these issues, we have to see, man, all of the beautiful benefits to invention, to the ways in which technology helps human beings become all that our, our potential would recognize and be able to live into, but then also to recognize, man, there are some paths we can go down where technology could be used to manipulate human beings or really draw us off this path that doesn't really lead us to flourishing lives. I know in your work, some of the interesting wearable technology, non-contact sensors, algorithms, you've created so many different systems and you've helped people, specifically people that have had autism, epilepsy, depression, PTSD, sleep, stress, dementia, automatic nervous system disorders. I'm curious how you've seen technology interact with any one of those, maybe as an example of where we've seen this really start to improve people's lives in areas where they maybe had given up hope that there was going to be a way that they could process through the burden that they were carrying. Yeah, it's uh, it's ongoing research, I'll say. There's so much more we uh, need to be doing that we're not able to do yet. Uh, but I'll give one quick example. When we were working in the early days on uh, helping people on the autism spectrum communicate better. Uh, at first, we thought they were having trouble reading other people's faces. And that is that is true for some people, but not everybody on the spectrum. One came to me one day and said, Roz, you have it all wrong. My biggest problem is not reading other people's faces. My biggest problem is you're not reading my emotion, which you know made me feel about you know, one centimeter tall, right? I felt terrible. I said, "What? what is it that I'm missing? And she said, it's not just you, it's everybody's misreading my emotion. Uh, well, what is it we're missing? She said, we're missing their stress. Uh, and I realized that many people had atypical ways that they, uh, they looked or sounded when they were stressed. And furthermore, we had a device in our lab that we were using to monitor the arousal dimension of emotion, kind of how amped up you were, how calm you were, and that that related to a key dimension of stress, the sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight. So we built a version of that, that she and others could take into daily life. And if they chose, they could share that data with others. They could keep it private. They could wear it in a way that, um, you know, it only informed them, or they could uh, give a visual graph of it to other people who could then see that things like rocking or repetitive movements might be very calming for them. And while one of the um, little boys, uh, the kid brother of another guy in my lab, was wearing it over uh, Christmas break, he had an unusually huge response in his data. And I thought, that doesn't, uh, that's the biggest stress response I've ever seen in my life, right? That we've stressed people out every way possible trying to uh, understand stress at MIT. Uh, we have Boston driver stress, we have qualifying exam stress, we have lots of different things um, naturally occurring is what we usually try to capture. And in this case, what we captured exceeded everything I'd ever seen before. Uh, and as I was trying to understand, you know, maybe our sensor was broken or something else, I learned that this young boy had had a grand mal seizure. And in fact, it had caused the stress response that at that time was being measured on both, both wrists. It had caused it to go up on only one wrist. So you know, my initial thought was, you can't be stressed on one wrist and not the other. Our sensors must be broken. Um, but after lengthy debugging, which you can hear the old story in a TED talk I gave, uh, there's we learned that we were actually getting a response with um, grand mal seizures, generalized tonic-clonic seizures. So we did lots more work with people with epilepsy, Children's Hospital Boston, Brigham and Women's Hospital, and gold standard video EEG data, and now our electrodermal data, this key sympathetic nervous system stress signal. Uh, and then with the great work of uh, Empatica, a spin-out company um, from my lab, they developed a device that made it, it was the first uh, wearable to make it through FDA clearance, first smartwatch to make it through FDA clearance. And um, today it's out there, uh, it's called Embrace 2, and it is helping alert to generalized tonic-clonic seizures. Wow. Uh, which it's really important to alert to. Um, if you know somebody with these seizures, make sure they know. Doctors are supposed to tell, but they don't always, um, that while it's a very low risk, there is a risk of death uh, from these seizures. 
And the risk of death is significantly lower if somebody's present there to help you at the time that you have the seizure. So people should not be alone when they have these seizures. They should use some kind of an alerting device to um, get somebody there yeah. and increase the chance that they'll uh, be fine afterwards. Yeah. Well, that's a great example of how that type of tech is helping heal people and and help save lives. I mean, that's amazing. Um, a lot of our audience are people of faith, the Christian faith. You know, they believe God's designed human beings to function and flourish, and he's created this amazing neural pathways and the ways in which our brains function. And they can also be a little bit hesitant about new technologies, right, that could could appear mm -hmm. to, in some ways, usurp God's design for how a human being ought to function or interfere or disconnect even the ways that they naturally might process information. And I'm curious what you would say to somebody who might have a little bit of fear, many times out of ignorance or not totally understanding how it works, maybe just reading a headline here or there that makes them think it's dehumanizing to use wearables, for example, or to potentially have technology intersect their brain or their thoughts or their emotions, and it feel like maybe that should be private. I'm not sure that was ever meant to be on public display. What are ways you would maybe help somebody see how perhaps God's given us this technology, he's given us these inventions, he's given us this ability to understand more about who we are, and because of it, we're actually becoming more human because of the impact of this type of technology? Um, you're raising really important issues. I wish we had even more time to, to talk about. Um, first of all, the privacy, all of our emotions should not be made public. I think it is very important that... Uh, you know, we are made to and allowed to have private thoughts, or at least private to one another. I, I, you know, believe the mind behind the whole universe, you know, sees and knows all, but one another, that's a different thing, right? And so we, uh, we put privacy and the user or wearer's control over the data and the technology at the top. Very important. We don't, we don't gather anything without people's prior informed consent. Uh, and I've, even in my first spin out, you know, we, we really, in early days when you need like every dollar to pay your bills and pay salaries, we turned away dollars uh, of people who wanted us to sense things without that fully informed consent and without respecting people's privacy. So I'm staunchly on that That's side great. of protecting uh, people. Um, the technology really is not always, but I, in my opinion, needs to be built in service and honor and respect of human dignity and human worth. And that's a design choice we make. Um, it is the case that uh, when we quantify certain aspects of things like our physiology related to emotion, um, we are not reducing anybody to these numbers. I, I think it's really important to, to be clear. We're not um, the computer's not reading and knowing your innermost feelings. It's not. Uh, it's it's not extracting things from you that you um, you know you don't choose to share. Uh, in at least not with our wearables. Now I am a little worried. There are some new kinds of non-contact sensing that can read your heart rate, your respiration, um, some aspects of your physiology changing at a distance, and I think those need to be uh, regulated because those can be used without people's prior informed consent. Uh, and there are some countries using those right now. I don't think the U.S. is using them without people's prior informed consent, uh, except possibly TSA type places. Yeah. But these are things we should be asking about in our society and having conversations about because some of these technologies really, I think, can be used against people. And I'm not, uh, I think you can tell I'm definitely not in yeah. supportive of that. Um, but I do want to underscore that as we quantify and learn things about um, the human, there's a role for everybody, even those who are not a technology developer, to ask questions. Don't be afraid about being skeptical. It's good to be skeptical. It's good to ask questions. Not everything that's being built is good. Um, it might be built with good intentions, um, but it might backfire, right? And yeah. while we, you know, I, I know in our lab and hopefully in those I get to have some uh, interactions with or influence with, we're building with the best of intentions. It still doesn't mean we can see the future, right? We can't see all possible uses. So we depend on others to help imagine with us the good uses, the bad uses, uh, and help us, um, you know, put a stop to the things that are leading to, to harm, uh, or hopefully never get those things built in the first yeah. place. 
Man, I appreciate you saying all that. The informed consent piece especially, I feel like that's been a little bit of a lost conversation in recent time to appreciate the need to talk to a patient about what could come of this experiment or the ways in which this technology might affect your body um, and even pointing to the ways technologies could be used that aren't actually leading to health or human flourishing and that we need to ask questions. We need to push back. We need to kind of try to understand because um, the the myth of progress, right? That just because it's new and innovation, this is somehow going to lead to better human life has not always played out well. Um, but when you make those kind of claims or you ask those kinds of questions, many times you're looked at as somebody who's trying to prevent progress and innovation when in fact you're many times just trying to actually conserve what we know to be good um, and not risk losing that. And so I thank you for that. Um, and I also think, man, as we, you you know more about this than me, but it seems like there's so much more electromagnetic technology that's interfacing with our bodies. We're in it all the time. Our phones, you know, signals, Wi-Fi, all, all of these things, which I don't know that we tr- fully understand. You would understand way more than I do, but it seems like we've introduced a lot of new dynamics in the last 20 years, 30 years into our atmosphere, into our environment that for human beings, we're still trying to figure out what is that doing to our bodies? Does it affect us at all or is it not a problem? And I, and I think those are areas of study that people of faith need to continue to press into because it does affect life. It affects how the body functions. Is it functioning the way God designed yeah. it? And those are big ethical questions that um, we need more people exploring. So I appreciate yeah, you raising and, and that is regulated. The RF, the radiation, the electromagnetism, uh, and new devices, um, those things are regulated. So yeah. I don't think we have to, well, it never hurts to ask. <laughs> Everybody can always ask. Uh, but yeah, it seems my my yeah. understanding of that is it's regulated, but not always. The studies haven't always been done and played out well to ensure human safety in some of those even regulations. But that's a whole other topic or conversation for another day. But I I just appreciate that you're aware of man. We've got to ask good questions. There, no question's a dumb question when it comes to new innovation and technology. And you've been asking tough questions for a long time, and it's led to a lot of good in the world. And so thank you for your work. Thank you for pursuing this unique burden and calling that you have been led into. And we're going to continue to track and watch all these great things you're doing and the the intention with which you do it. I think that's what people listening to this are going to appreciate, how much you do care about the ethics, how much you do care about putting it through this filter and lens of human dignity. And that's what we care about here. And so thank you for your work. Thank you for being with us today. Thanks, Gabe. Thanks for your work, too, helping people learn about these areas and be encouraged to keep asking questions. Well, I hope you enjoyed this conversation. She's fascinating, and I want to encourage you. Go explore her work. Go listen to this TED Talk linked in the show notes so you can hear even more detail about the stories that she was sharing. But I take away for me personally her commitment to ethics. You heard me emphasize that. I love hearing of a person who sits in their role and they're asking the tough questions. They're asking the big questions all of us should ask, no matter where we lead. It could be in the education field. It could be in media, entertainment. It could be anywhere where we are going to ask the question, how is the work that I'm doing either contributing to redeeming what it means to be human or contributing to something that actually harms human beings? And when we pose that question, no matter what field we're in, we're actually a part of what I believe God wants to be doing in the world. Now, I want to encourage you for more conversations like this, go to thinkmedia.com, spelled T-H-I-N-Q, media.com. And when you go to thinkmedia.com, you are going to come into an array of talks and conversations and clips, all made available to you for free and all made available with the emphasis on how can we as Christians be those who are leading conversations that help others find wisdom. And so, so many of the people that are part of this, that are thought leaders, that have partnered with us, have said, we want to use these talks and conversations to create dialogue in our classrooms, whether you're a science teacher, a math professor, a Bible teacher, or in the living room of your home with your children, to use these talks to start conversations that lead to wisdom. I think we all recognize in our world today, there's a lot of confusing topics. There's a lot of information being thrown at us, but we don't always reach wisdom. 
And we can reach wisdom when we actually know the source of all wisdom, when we go to that source, and then when we rely on that to help us better navigate the tensions and the confusion of our world today. And so go to thinkmedia.com. There you can learn more about being a thought leader. You can learn how we believe Christians ought to think about the world and take you through a curriculum that allows you to better understand thoughtfulness in the midst of this new age. And I hope that it encourages you and continues to give you the tools and resources you need to lead right where you've been called. Thank you.